Hey, how are you rubbing him? A little more intense, a little more to the point because shit's counting down to one of the most important days in recent history. And that is when I scratch my most recent lottery ticket. No, I'm talking about when the next election is. Good day, kids. Thank you for joining the Far Reaches broadcast, proudly brought to you by BNK Auto Salvage. Uh, we've already had feedback that somebody wants to know how they can subscribe to the podcast. It's not sponsored by anybody. And I said simply, uh, you sponsor more to be sponsored by nobody. But until then, you can pound sand. And so we are proudly sponsored by BK Auto Salvage, located on Highway 203 outside of the big, or as some would say, La Grande. Also located in beautiful downtown historic Baker City at uh, 3370 17th Street. So for over 40 years, uh, B&K has been serving the Grand Run Valley and surrounding areas. So check them out, give them a holler, and tell them thanks for sponsoring the Far Reaches podcast. And tonight we have all of the Reachers have joined us. We are proud to be here, happy to be here. We are available at all locations where any kind of media is available, uh, be it YouTube, uh, be it on the old school traditional podcast type things, such as on iTunes or Google Cast or Spotify or something you might find carved in your mom's kitchen table. We are there for your pleasure, and we thank you for being here for ours. So we're going to kick this week off. We have a full uh, spectrum of reachers. We have myself, Mr. Micah. We have Mr. Raleigh Bigsby up in beautiful Northeast Oregon. We have Richard Bradbury in Southeast Oregon. And we have Mr. Joel in parts unknown, sometimes New York, sometimes the Pendleton. And judging by the background, I'd say Mr. Joel is in the Pendleton as we speak. So uh, congratulations. And we will start off like we always do by saying thank you for one and B, kicking into our weekly update, which gives you a little bit of background about what's been going on in our twisted world since last we spoke. And I thought we uh, kind of just brings everybody to speed and gives a little insight. And sometimes we get a little carried away about where we go, depending on uh, current events. And so, um, you know, Mr. Bigsby, you look a little antsy in the pantsy. And I think we will start in my upper left-hand corner of the screen with Mr. Raleigh. Raleigh, what's your weekly update since we last spoke and met? Uh, basically, what's important in your world right now? Well, we got Cav shipped. Uh, Ooh, maybe we've done a podcast since then already. I don't remember. But uh, we've got a couple loads of Cav shipped. And Beautiful. And Money in the bank. Wire. Hot wire and some aftermath fields to get uh, cows on some green feed. Outstanding. We got a spell of temperatures that were a little <clears throat> lower than we'd like to have thus far, but uh, it looks like it's turning around and we're going to start preparing for winter. That's kind of. It's, an, it's a knock and it's late October and uh, anything basically from now till, now till March is pretty much fair game. Yeah. Yeah, in this neck of the woods, definitely. I mean, uh, what's your elevation up there in God's country? I think right here at the house, we're like 4,800, I think. Okay, so pretty close to Richard as well, as well yeah. 4,100. And, uh, but we, we get, uh, the, what the Wallow is right here behind us, we can get socked in in the valley and hold some colder temperatures than a lot of places. That's true, yeah adjacent so Ooh, um, adjacent. Yeah. but it's always clear we we get a few foggy days and i don't know it's it's a hard place to beat living so. despite all that fun yeah, yeah. i really uh if I could um, wave the uh, old magic wand yeah that would be one of my top places for sure got a uh, little elk hunting starting tomorrow and mm. yeah, that's about it that's right. You got some family there now, some other folks rolling in this evening. We appreciate you uh, carving this time for the uh, gathering of the herd, so to speak. And uh, you must be in your rocker, either that or your 
curtains getting ready to blow over your head because that's pretty trippy on the video portion here, kids. Yeah. That's some cool shit. Gonna go, gonna go hunt little elk? What's that? What you said? Gonna go hunt little elk? No, yes, big elk only. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> little elk. Later he graduated season, high school back in 95. Little elk's gone on to big things now. Yeah. Yeah, I had, uh, had a few elk in, our, in my high school career there. Red elk. There was some elk in there. Miss Miss Red Elk? I won't get on that sidetrack, but uh, good day to you, my dear. Yes. <laughs> One of my weaknesses, I'll tell you that for damn sure. Yeah. Anyways, only a couple of us know about that. Anyways, um, it's trophy hunting time, Mr. Joel. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, it's Danny, Mr. Mr. Bigsby. I, again, I appreciate you uh, jumping on tonight with everything going on around you and and uh, yeah. we, we, for uh, those of you playing along at home, we, we had intended to be already out distributed tonight. We had some technical difficulties earlier, so we had to kick it back a couple nights. And and so uh, it's going to be, you know, time it gets to all. It'll be a day or two after we intended, but hopefully you still appreciate all we have to offer uh, my Reacher fans. Yeah, so. And it might not be quality, but. Well, it's all more about quantity at this point. So, yeah, take it all, she said. Yeah, so. What's um, going on in Richard's world? Richard, Brad Burmy. I want to go to Joel for the next one. Okay, okay, so Richard has to poop real quick. We'll get back to him momentarily. Mr. Joel, good day, sir. What's your weekly update consist of? Uh. <clears throat> Yeah, Six. living the Pelton life. I feel like uh, trying to enjoy myself when people are, are working. It's kind of tough. I mean, I'm working too. And the, and the good thing about my job is that I should be this week confirmed for a new role. So I can finally oh, leave tell. my my old job behind. New Just role? a different same world company of or I'm gonna be Same company? Different yeah, company? Yeah, okay. I'm going to be doing... Same company, new boss. I'll be doing... Uh, uh, Volker rule compliance and fiduciary compliance. What was that first part? So, uh, uh, Volker rule. Can you explain that? The I'm Volker sure rule r- briefly is, uh, I think it was named after Paul Volker, who was the Fed guy. Mm. Um, and it came out of the Dodd-Frank Reform Act back gotcha. in 10, 12 years ago. Yes, sir. Um, and it, it, it's intended to prevent banks from taking your deposit and then uh air quote gambling it uh so which is called proprietary trading so uh, oh, gotcha. uh especially when it comes to like a systemically important bank where if the bank goes out of business it could threaten the economy mm-hmm. so it uh, prevents like the london whale situation at jp morgan um so i have a lot to learn to catch up on how to advise people on on that rule but uh, that'll is that be exciting your- more, more of an advisor Re- role exciting, as, right? as opposed to compl- – you're sort of in compliance now, and you're going to be more in advisory, uh, sort of preventive next. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, so this role – so previously in compliance, I've always been sort of a, you know, doing operations sort of work, if yeah. you will. Yeah. And this would be more – ideally, you know, if, as, as you get more and more uh, – knowledgeable of it you can start working directly with the business to advise them through deals making sure that you're not preventing or not breaking rules oh i'm saying so maybe some more interaction some more diversity uh maybe tap again to some more of your intellectual capacity also yeah yeah for hopefully and hopefully i can keep up that's what i gotta be worried about oh well i i think you'll rise to the challenge and that starts next week is that what we said I think it should be official this week, but oh, I, I'll see. Any. Uh, they've been acting slow, so it might be well, next week or well, you're, even a month. So you're still within the same company, just transitioning to a different department, and sounds a bit more of a sort of stimulating and maybe hands-on type uh, role. Yep. So I've been training a lot, taking reading a lot about it. So that's been my week. Outstanding. Well, congratulations. That's uh for those of you that don't know. I mean, we give Joel a decent ration of shit uh during this time but he was basically the first person we thought of like when we do this podcast we need this dude involved because of 
A, where he comes from, but B, more importantly, his intellectual prowess, if you will, and like just his thought process. And even though it doesn't match up with some of ours all the time, it definitely reflects a higher level of intelligence and interaction that maybe some people don't have an experience with. And so, uh, you know, he's a key role to the fun and success we have here on Far Reaches. And, and sometimes we, you know, it's just good for us to remind people that, uh, you know, Joel's day job is is pretty fucking impressive as far as who he works for and what he does. And so the fact that he comes and plays with us uh, every couple of weeks is pretty cool. And we definitely uh, appreciate that. And it's, it's just sort of lends to the fact that no matter where you're from, if you have a bit of drive and determination, you, you can go do pretty much whatever you want to do. And I think all of us exemplify that in a, in a different way, shape or form. Um, and some of us have gone away and came back uh, to where we really should have been to begin with. And some are just still on the cutting edge of that outer sector. So yeah, um, we all have different strengths and it's just cool that we have, this diversity of the group and everybody's got different experiences and different skills. And so, uh, yeah, we give each other crap, but we're also extremely proud of what we all get to do and what we are. And so, uh, Joel, congratulations to you on that. And we're so proud of you to be part of this. And <laughs> all those, and all those kind words. And it's not even my birthday or anything. <laughs> Uh, fuck your birthday. I don't care about uh, that. Um, you quit being nice now again. So. Yeah, we're back to normal. I just, you know, yeah, I actually had some, I had about 45 seconds of community service. I still needed to fulfill. And according to my PO, that fulfilled it. And so I thought, <laughs> and if I can make Joel feel good about himself and check that off the list <laughs> at the same time, that's what we call a win win where I'm from. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, put that in your pipe and smoke it mister so um honestly and it, it's a little kind of maybe you might call some backhanded uh braggadocery if you will that you know we might look like morons and act that way most of the time but when you add us all up it's, it's a pretty good pot of uh, advice and thought and consent so uh just a sh chance to shine a bit of light on one of the reachers also um and, and thank you for his time that, that's the main part so um with that being said, Richard, are you composed yourself enough to give us your weekly update yet or need some more time? I've been trying to find the book that I read by Paul Lorca that's brilliant, but I can't find it. Oh, well, sure not. You need some more time? I can I can scat for a few minutes or make something up. And, no. um, okay. Yeah. But the cool thing about Volker is he was Reagan's Fed chairman. Oh, and shit. Okay. Yeah. I knew the name. I just couldn't place him. Yeah. He's the one that convinced Reagan to keep with the high interest rates in the early 80s which is that yeah uh, to combat the inflation and sort of mm -hmm. right at the economy well yeah because you, you know values yeah. were just ape shit yeah so but he was the only one that held the line when everybody else wanted to drop the interest rates mm -hmm. so, a lot of debate on whether that was the right thing but uh so we're probably still writing that choice so that's anyways and it sounds like somehow his rule now plays into the the stability of the banks after the credit default swaps. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. Oh well, all forms of proprietary trading, and then you making sure banks don't get too heavily invested in things like hedge funds. Yeah, um, yeah which makes me wonder. Like, banks don't traditionally invest in what we sort of thought they did earlier in the century, like the down the downtown, they tend to invest in more exotic things than local businesses and that kind of stuff and more um, investment vehicles and tools rather than actual hard capital. I, well, I mean, you'd, find, you'd find that the commercial bank and even the retail bank, which are the two lines of businesses in all of the, major systemically important banks they would invest on main street uh, the global banking divisions so like uh, mm. all well, which is where the investment banks sit yeah um they would do more of that complicated 
complicated, sophisticated is the word, sophisticated uh, investing and trading and dealing with uh, multinational corporations and meeting their banking needs. It's just fascinating to me, the banks, and like to see can this con contraction of rural banks and the regional banks, um, some of them are getting bigger. There's far, harder and harder to find places for ag loans. Like our major bank in Lakeview that did ag loans just pulled out. So I'm actually thinking about going to a bank in California because it's one of the only regional banks that does uh, ag loans anymore. So it's just, uh, and the three banks that we have in uh, Lake County, which is a timber, a farming, and an uh, agriculture town, none of them specialize in agriculture anymore. So it's an interesting thing. And I see this happening all over is a lot of the smaller banks that s serve rural America are not specializing in that. Anymore. How do we counter that? That's such a I, specialty that needs to be. I don't know if. Tended. Uh, I don't know if Old West Federal Credit Union is in Burns or not, but they're based out of John Day and they're serving. They're in Burns for sure. Yeah. Yeah. They're servicing a lot of people in our neck of the woods up here. And, um, I don't know if Burns is close enough. For Sounds like not. swine flu. Oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm honestly thinking that Plumas Bank is the best bet for us. Um, What's the name? So, Plumas. Well, we have a good relationship with Eastern Oregon, but they're the ones that pulled out on us. I mean, we've been operating with just an ATM for the last. Yeah, unless it's months. unless it's prom night, you don't want to get pulled out on. So, yeah, yeah that's not. Anyways. Interesting, Joel. I, I have I have a million questions, but uh, congratulations on your new uh, endeavor. Thanks. Um, we, oh, yeah. uh, Richard and I, jammed up to uh, Idaho this week, last week, stayed in a beautiful Airbnb on a ranch in Grandview, Idaho. Just uh, a, uh, within a mile of the Grandview feedlot, so... That was oh, yeah. exciting like to go see what Simplot's up to. And uh, we had Simplot cattle all around us at this little ranch house. And we uh, went and did our first in-person grass-fed meeting since for in 11 months. Wow. Well, we went for about every six weeks, every six months. So. What was the, uh, can you give me a sense of the spirit, just the difference in in-person in meetings versus uh virtual everybody was i would say very relieved and to have the kids running around and have uh just to be and we toured the some of the a lot of the cattle were right around where we planned it so that a lot of the cattle were concentrated right around where the meeting was and um so the first part of the day was just um touring and seeing uh some of the so we've been utilizing a lot of cover crops mm -hmm. and that um, Snake River Valley um, area, so we're and it's dropped dropped the winter cost of feeding the grass fed cattle down significantly. Oh yeah, for sure. So and it's a big transitions from where we were at last year. So it's actually cool to go and see that on the ground, um, and just you know we all decided that we were in a good spot as an organization and uh, pretty happy with the direction that things are going in the momentum we have. And all in all, for the, our business, is 2020 wasn't too ter terrible bad. Of course, we're not through it yet. But uh, as far as our as far as Desert Mountain grass fed beef is considered, it was a good year. And so, well, when uh, you started shipping out to the wider regions, I think in this more of an online presence probably responded to the demand you were probably seeing uh, in general. Yeah, and we like we and we cut a lot of costs like the. <coughs> Helping more cover crops and that kind of stuff and uh, more places to feed cattle. Um, it's, it's helping quite a bit. Getting more gain during the winter and fall is critical. And then our other big news is, and I shared this online, uh, we will be sending cattle to Colorado to help the Denver start of our organization get oh. up and go. Not Colorado, to Kansas to get the Denver side of the thing up and going. So, uh there are some guys there down there that are, had gone to no till and were really uh, sort of trying to transition with the help of uh, Ray Archuleta and Gabe Brown. Mm. 
uh, they needed extra cattle. So they approached us because there was some relationships that sort of Idaho and that part of Kansas that bridged us together. And so we're hoping that that'll take off and super excited to go down there and start applying the same things that worked with the model up here down there. And hopefully we'll have a, uh, a uh, regional supply of cattle for the Denver region. So what's the excited. common or is there one a common cover crop that you're utilizing? Uh, to get that uh, response and, and best return? So people freak out if they don't understand this. So I'm going to say it very clearly. So non-mature corn. So oh, they plant oh it, interesting. Yeah, so they plant it. It never develops to where it has ears. Sure, yeah. It's more of a it, biomass type deal. Yeah. For sure. And carbon, uh, probably carbon ratio for the, the soil. Yep. Also with uh, barley, um, Timothy, lots of, uh, but we, did, we can't do the beets and stuff, but uh, we got some stuff that's uh, got turnips in it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's this, uh, so we got these salad mixes now and we're finding like that if you plant the Timothy in with different plants, then the, you can go in and get the Timothy and then come back and it'll regrow. So and the interesting thing about Timothy is about a carbon it puts back in the mm. uh, soil. Tremendous. Tremendous, yeah. I, I've Which, been studying up on this quite a bit lately, not, not to shortchange what your activities are by any means, but I've noticed that there's definitely that that multi-species of that, that, that salad crop, if you will, approach when you got 12 to 20 different species planted in a field at the same time as opposed to usually, you know, traditional cover crop is – is one maybe two at a time and, and and i think salad crop is probably the best description ever uh, mm -hmm. to get this this really great cover uh for carbon sequestration and obviously you know, for soil stability at the same time but such a diverse crop which is great for grazing and covers and ecology and everything else involved that's just a completely foreign to my way of thinking but i really glommed on to that i thought it was a great deal so critical not to just, and I'm not, how should I put this? It's difficult to not bash another whole segment, but yeah. Yeah. Um, that having armor 360 days a year yeah. is having that soil covered some way or the other and having a root system still intact in it is, uh, Super important, I, I believe. I, I When you think about, and not to get out, way off, sidetrack your kids, but that way that, that A, that, that, root, that root system is like multifaceted as far as benefits from A, you know, nutrient absorption and transformation, but also when it breaks back down, when it goes dormant and, and back into organic matter and soil structure, I think that's incredibly important to have this multi-structured, ecosystem in that field i.e saying that things are maturing and dying at different stratus and, and different ratios throughout the year or even like just say a, uh, say a six month regime that's a constant building and reintroduction of that organic matter and nutrients to that system and i think that's just so advantageous and dare I say brilliant to have that sort of structure in place where it's not like all right, from June to July, it's going to grow like crazy. It's going to mature. It's going to die off. It's going to come back in. And then it basically is on its own till next March or April where you have this stratified process of where things are coming up and maturing, going back in and, and retaining different parts of nutrients throughout the year. I think it's absolutely stellar. And in some cases... Do you have to, ir do you have to irrigate that? Do you have to irrigate all this? A little bit. A mm, little bit, but most that, of it's going to be in a fallow is period. Stressing, is that stressing your water supply for something that's not really directly contributing think, to our food sources? I, I would say I think no. The, I think, I'd say the, the benefit outweighs the – especially if you can keep that water – as long as that water is not, like, mm -hmm. eroding everything and it's actually being saturated into the fields, then, yeah, I'd say it's – a for, for those of you listening along at home or playing the home game, you know, traditionally you'd harvest the crop, 
and then sometimes it's bare. Sometimes you might no till, uh, and then until the next rotation comes through. And, and there's been some instances where people are replanting multiple species at one time, like we've discussed, let's say 10 to 20 different species at a time into a field. And they're all obviously going to grow and mature at different rates, have different uh, needs and desires, implications, et cetera. And so you have this constant kind of cycling of nutrients and requirements throughout the dormant season. And as Joel just asked, like, do you have to water it? Well, depending on the time of year, maybe a little bit, but most of the time it's going to help capture any water that comes in. And then that breakdown and that recycle and that release is the key component. And sometimes it's going to be grazed. I mean, it can be great, amazing grazing material, depending on the components uh, and structure. Sometimes it's going to mature. You're going to fold it back in. Maybe if you do a, some kind of tillage or, you know, no, like a, an easy till or something like that also. So it's, it's just a different way of thinking about running that land between crops, basically, and still finding a way to, um, and the, one of the main sources of concern is that carbon capture and storage from those plants growing on that dirt at the same time um, is really one of the main benefits overall when it's usually dormant or bare it's got 15 species that are all peaking at different times and capturing this carbon uh, and and releasing uh, oxygen at the same time over the whole process so it, it, it's really amazing to me to to see some of these systems coming up and, and how they can all play together. And I just got two quick plugs and then I'll be done. Um, so no, that thing is also adding $200 up to $200 back to per acre to that farmer that Amazing. on top of what they're already making on top of the, by having the cat, having the cattle go through. Yeah. So it's another whole line of revenue. It's not, enough to support the farm but supplementally on it might top be of cattle it might be sheep it might be goats it might be pigs chickens seriously it, it, it might Care be a money. menagerie of things going through there also yeah yeah mm -hmm. um and then the other thing is if you haven't listened to the uh far reaches extra that we did last weekend with christina rebellia yeah really fascinating to see um what's happening in water and uh it's moving really super fast and uh there is no expertise out there it's the wild wild west of water and i think that it's just gonna be uh i'd say in the next five years w how we perceive our relationship with water in the west is going to be flipped on its head and it is uh, and will remain the most limiting factor of all that we do and I'm going to be the canary in the coal mine, and I'm going to tell everybody and encourage everybody to start paying attention to your water. Know everything you need to know about your water because uh, it's going to be the next big battle. Well, I, I think in some That's regards, it has been for a long time. It's just resurfacing again, for sure. Yeah. What, what I've learned in real estate is there's the history that you get passed down orally. And then there's the history that's told in the water rights. And those histories never diverge. Which one counts the most? The water rights. Thank you. Yes, exactly. The real history. It's that's what's on history. paper, what's counted as factual. Yeah. Because we have yeah. prior appropriations and we have uh, first it's time. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. But power follows the water. It's, it's, and it has been for the last 50 years, just not many people are clued into it yet. It hasn't been that uh, scarce or important, but it, it's like, well, we always say, they're not making any more dirt. Well, guess what? They're not making much more water either. It's, it's even a more scarce resource. So, you know, if Colorado got pissed off and said, hey, California, pound sand, uh, that'd be pretty interesting. So, you hear that, Colorado? Uh, anyways, yeah, so. Just saying, yeah, it's, it's certainly, um, it's what's a rule, like, well, what, what, what did Mark Twain say? Uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, you know? Yep. That's, that's the truth, yeah, so. Um, shit, my week update's not near that exciting. It's, you guys have all had some pretty 
hands-on uh, CAG stuff. I, I've just been swamped with work. Um, really, a, a lot of new things going on there. Um, swamped the home stuff and, and uh, getting getting things sorted and finding, new, finding where I want to live, potentially for a semi-extended period of time. Uh, that's been entertaining. Um, a lot of exploration around the region uh, on, my, on my new motorcycle. So I've seen a lot of cool, tremendous amount of parks and springs and ponds and lakes and waterfalls and rivers. And it is a definitely uh, water diverse area here for sure. You can't go more than about 50 yards of in some kind of state park or lake or river. Um, and yeah, there's gator signs pretty much everywhere you go, which always makes me kind of giggle. So that part's been fun. Um, just really uh, sad as it sounds, been focused on work and trying to get uh, all that squared away. Just enjoying my 75 degree weather when my friends from Wisconsin and Nebraska send me videos of snow. I laugh, walk outside and show them the green grass in 75 degrees. Now granted, I miss uh, this time of year and cool weather and elk hunting getting ready to come close but uh yeah also get to go fish for redfish and uh any time of year so there's that so you know unfortunately not that much of excitement for me just uh, a lot of work stuff i can't talk about yet due to contractual agreements and uh, that sort of thing so um just know that i'm having fun and doing well, yes. So um, we'll go on to our next segment, one of our more popular ones uh, of all of our segments. And this is our movie review sort of discussion. And, and Mr. Joel had picked American Graffiti, which I found interesting since it was made well before, uh, quote unquote, his time and featured many components that he might not be dare I say overly familiar with, I, I think the main component that I really picked up again after this time was, was the impact of cruising, which certainly in Lakeview was freaking the thing. Um, you drove around a lot, you stopped in the Safeway parking lot, which sadly and bad choice and timing on our part was right across the street from the cop shop as we called it. But yep, that's, a lot of times where you'd stop and hang out and bullshit for a while and you go drive around again. And, but you know, cruising around, quote unquote, cruising around in, in Lakeview in high school was certainly one of the top two or three activities that we engaged upon. And it was really, you know, I watched, I watched American Graffiti and I watched also the making of American Graffiti. So Joel, you owe me about three and a half hours uh, for this week. Um, and to hear how important that, cruising component was to the movie and the times really struck a great chord for me about what we did in high school that was like one of the major things so uh, I thought that was great it reminded me of all the fun times we had doing that and some of the stupid things we got out of from doing that and so I guess my first question is Joel like why did you pick this movie and what does it mean to you well so it's one of those movies that I've just always, it's a classic. So you're, you've always been aware of it. Sure. I've never considered watching it. And one night I was like, <clears throat> let's see what this bastard's all about. Right. Van down by the river and it came on. And so you watched it. Yeah. Yeah. So I put that on. It was made in 1973. <laughs> After quite a bit struck, of trials and tribulations, I might add. Yeah. What struck me as odd about it. Um, and interesting is that it's based on this cruising stuff. It's like a nostalgia movie based in that, in in that time, yeah. 60, in 1962. So they yeah. made it. What struck me weird about that is they made a movie about nostalgia like of something that after, took yeah. place 10 years before. <laughs> like, yeah. we wouldn't make a nostalgia movie of 2010. Yeah. yeah. And then I couldn't, I, I was a little impaired. And, again but i couldn't figure out like i wonder if this one has came back out in 1973 if it was actually nostalgia for them 
the viewer in 1973 or if this was just like oh this is about just a regular movie from 10 years ago so i did some yeah it was kind of i thought that was it was weird so i looked into it and it's like an interesting scenario with like you know the premises of the filmmaker is that you know 1962 was kind of like the last age of innocence and that based on like all the events that transpired yeah. in the late 60s uh that's exactly like what that culture innocence you know yeah. culture changed so much more in those 10 years apparently than they would between 2010 and 2020 yeah, um, exactly i couldn't agree more I it, yeah I, I could i couldn't figure out the movie when i was watching it i is one of those scenarios where it was, I confused myself. I was thinking. I thought maybe I was thinking about it too hard. Well, you might have been, but I think you, you, you definitely struck on that point that I picked up on again from watching it this last time was, yes, it was truly Age of Innocence, and then within a couple of years, wham, completely different perspective and expectations and. And overall, I think perspective, and that just says a lot about how that transition went from that early '60s to late '60s, mid '70s of just like uh, you know some disruption and and protest, and and which is which is I think is healthy. I think that whole period was good for our country, but it's such a shift and change from what it was, and also how that impacted the players within the story and what they did later on and how the, how they moved. Um, I, I, I got the same thing for sure. Like just, it really just short time yeah. frame. They were dramatic change, small snapshot. Yeah. It's about like their last night before they're mm-hmm. supposedly going on with the rest of their life. Which I think um, all of right us from the small, Vietnam War. small towns can definitely relate to that it seemed like a much bigger decision in that small town frame to like, I'm just graduating now. And what happens next? I think, and that's my, that's my bias, I guess, is it seems more important when you come from a small town of what you do next, as opposed to if we all graduated from Bronx high, what we do next. That's my perspective. It might be inaccurate, but that's just what I think. Well, yeah, it's deeper than that. With in the movie, at the end of it, they say what happened to like the four main characters. Yeah. So yeah, in the definitely. movie, they have these ambitions, and at the end, one dies in Vietnam because MIA in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. One guy moved to Canada. Um, yeah. Probably, probably dodged the draft, right? And one guy yeah. stayed home and was like an insurance guy in his hometown. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's like none of them achieved what they were hoping to. Which is a deeper level also, because we've all had those, you know, I'm supposed to be a senator by now, according to high school. So uh, just delaying the inevitable, you know, and like I watched the making of and like Ron Howard's like, when I found out that my character was going to be an insurance salesman, that helped me really frame my role throughout the entire time, like how my, how my perspective and what I did with people was when he knew what his endpoint was, which I thought was interesting on several fronts. Like, A, that helps you as an actor, but B, like, wouldn't that be wild if we could know in high school for sure, like, what we're doing in 20 years? How crazy would that be? Like, freshman year, you check in, you get your class schedule, you get the books you got to buy, and oh, oh, by the way, Mr. Bradbury, uh, 20 years from now, you're going to be uh, selling real estate. Mr. Bigsby, you're running a ranch with your wife. Mr. Joel, you're a communist on the run. Micah, you're a witness for location in Florida. Congratulations. Wait, I would have put I would have put my life savings on a parlay bet that all three of you would end up in agriculture. <laughs> oh, so you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be. No, doing. I was um well, honestly, no, not at all. That was um I was gonna go in, I was military bound. I was gonna go to to Annapolis, like it was, it was not, uh, not really agriculture. As much agriculture as I did in high school, it was not agriculture in my uh, immediate future when I was uh, leaving my beloved L town. Yeah, hmm. I, I, I dare say, Richard Raleigh, what was your ambitions when you were wandering out of uh, 
LHS or PHS? Richard. I was going to stay. Basketball I mean, player. I got the – I got the heck out of – I went to Texas because I thought, well, I'll get out of town for a while. Yeah, you are drunk and tumbleweed for sure in that regard. Yeah. So I had a good time with that. Then I fell into the emergency response and just found a yeah good fit there and decided that that was a good place to spend about a decade. And then, dyslexic dude being logistics master. Figure that one out. Yeah. And then uh, – yeah, then um, I came back and started my second cow herd, and then 2008 hit, and I ended up in the oil field, just, just like a lot of people my age. So, um, not one thing that I predicted ever happened. So, <laughs> most, and, I mean, like, how many people can sit there and say, I started my second cow herd in 08? God's sake. I mean, seriously, dude, that's pretty impressive. I started, I started my third one in 2013. I know um, I was getting there next, but like like, like 99% of America can never say I started my first cow herd. And, you know, you know, within 15 years of high school, you had your third, for God's sake. That's awesome, dude. No, but uh, not in a million years that I think it's been eight years in North Dakota, two years in Wyoming, a year in Russia, and a year offshore. So, uh, yeah. I, 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 uh, I had a friend one time tell me that if I died today, I'd die. I've done in more things than most people. So, I uh, sort of take that as a silver or a badge huge, of honor. So, huge compliment. I start telling stories, and folks are like, "How many hundred years old are you?" I'm like, uh, "Not even one yet." Yeah, I'm like. <laughs> Dude, the amount of I'm like uh, I got nothing on some folks I know. Yeah, I'm just telling stories now. It's it's uh, it's not what I expected though, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome, Ralph. Uh, Richard. Uh, it's always interesting to prior prior to the podcast, most of my inquiries about Richard were through Micah, and it was always you know, where's Waldo? You know, what's what's Richard up to these days? Because and it's not like not like Richard was ever um, predictable in where he was going to be or what he was. Gonna oh be. no, no, that was... I, I think that that for me, knowing Richard, has always been intriguing. Like the the oil field and, and going to Russia and running a ranch and just the various things that that you've done with your career path have always been um, out of the out of the ordinary, you know. Which, but you've always come back to, to 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 your roots. Yeah. Well, it's always been inspiring too. Yeah. Seriously, not not to yeah. blow smoke on your trumpet, but like, it's what's inspired me to take the risks and chances I have in, in my career, and um, to think like, I don't want to, I don't want to regret saying no. You know, I want to look back and see, maybe I shouldn't have said yes, but I never want to look back and say, should, should, you know, and so that, you know, when we talked a lot when you were in Russia and I mean, I'll never forget when um, there's like this blind job opportunity comes from, and from you and your people, you knew when I, and you were in Russia and I was home and I was like, well, I'm thinking more about these and this and that. And you're like, Son of a bitch, I can't believe you turned it down. I'm like, dude, uh, I'm going to go. Wise man. Wise yeah, man. I was like, well, dude, I got nothing to lose, man. I want to write my freaking ticket if I'm getting my ass <laughs> drugged to Russia. After I just started seeing this hot chick and this is going on, I'm like, I'm writing my ticket. And if they don't like it, they can, they can kick rocks. And I, you know, you're like, what the hell, man? I'm like, that's just my mindset, dude. You know, so, but I never would have that opportunity if you wouldn't have said, what the hell? And, you know, it's just, it's just amazing that the, I think that's the most important part to me is the random connections and intersections that have been afforded to me for my experiences and the people I've had a chance to meet. That's the coolest part. Well, I think the interesting thing about Raleigh is he, he just courts controversy wherever he goes. It doesn't even mean to be in it. <laughs> it's just one of them things, you know, um, that's, pretty much safe bet with most of the big B clan themselves as a whole. And yeah. That's why I truly love them, each and every one of them. Um, 
it's just sort of a no Ben pound sand here I am sort of philosophy, which I, I could not tell you how much I appreciate that more than anything else. And so uh, I don't mean to get in this random far reach of circle jerk, but that's what we appreciate about each other. <laughs> and we're all, we're all different in where we come from in some degree. I think we're all different in where we well, are now. I think if Richard, if Richard was run, running for president, he'd be in the middle of the controversy of oil and gas and Russia connection. And I think he's compromised. He's certainly he, compromised. I don't know if can be sure of that. My first fucking thought was he's compromised for sure. Yeah. yeah. Here's got the got Richard the, Bradbury dossier. I've got out. the other you know, text messages to prove that shit. So one way or another, <laughs> uh, Joel, we're getting rich. Uh, yeah. Not getting rich. We're getting paid. Um, it's like, it's like the regular guy version of Hunter Biden, minus the, the crack. Oh, that hurts. It's, there's ambassadorships for you guys all, so don't worry. You're good. Oh, then, namaste. Yeah, I just want to go to somewhere, somewhere just, north where there's six-foot-tall blonde chicks that are buff. Yeah, if you don't mind. I watch a lot of uh, CrossFit of your, games. Yeah. Part of your cabinet somewhere in the back, you know. <laughs> I'll be in the liquor cabinet. Yeah. That'll be in your best <laughs> Hey, old Prince Bradbury. Uh, you know, and, and so, yeah, to, to, to bring the group back to somewhat of a focus, um, I'm not even sure what the fucking topic was on that part, to be honest with you. I mean, I have it written down. I still can't remember. We were relating our, our high school. Uh, we kind of got sidetracked on the high school, like what started you on what. Um, yeah, and I, it's, um, personally, it has a lot to do with it high school teachers we got to have, have a chance to have too that, that was pretty cool for, from from my point of view for sure but Richard had spoken and we'll probably keep the roles now just to continue on with the process if you will in a more official manner so <laughs> so you're wanting to know what uh, what did you, I mean what did you expect what was your ambitions I guess when you stumbled out of grade 12 as my friends in Canada would say uh, <laughs> and where are you gonna go next eh I knew college was somewhere in the mix. Um, of course, growing up in Pendleton and working on local farms and whatnot, it was just kind of a second nature to work when I could and go to school when I could. And then I uh, found myself looking into being a smoke jumper. Ah. And so I went to work for the Forest Circus and was... Thank you for saying circus, by the way, because I <laughs> was in a wilderness. I got, wilder I got in trouble for saying that when I worked for the circus myself, just so you know. Yeah. yeah. They should know what they are. Um, ended up being a hot shot my second year, and uh, which, which good, for those of you who don't know, that's pretty badass. Um, and made good money for the summer seasons, which allowed me to continue on my education and finish a four year. It only took eight years, but you know. Um, yeah, a lot of guys go to college for eight years. They're called doctors. Yeah. Anyways, I, uh, I didn't fulfill my my uh, smoke jumping ambitions because I got tired of working for the circus and didn't want to continue any further well, in that career. So, there was an arm issue that one summer too, but yeah. Yeah. Broken arm, but um, that was hot to trot. Yeah. Then I kind of once I got out of college. It, um, different opportunities going in my lap and ended up in Colorado working for a rodeo stock contractor and traveling all over the country hauling bucking horses and bulls and that was pretty bold of you <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and then uh, made my way back and knew that animal production agriculture was where I wanted to focus and went to work for various ranches and spent a year in Nevada in the middle of nowhere and um Hilton Ranch, right? Various outfits all over the place. And in between there, actually, I worked for a Western Stockman's and was a salesman for the state of Oregon or manager for the state of Oregon. And, um, just a multitude of things. But, you know, as it was from the get go, like Joel was saying, I'm probably the most poignant one that had agriculture pegged on my forehead. But I. I just never could get away from it. Always have enjoyed the uh, the lifestyle and the work that comes with it. Well, I think you were Aren't you working somewhere. 
built to work for yourself that? too. Well, and you know, it's ultimately that was the goal. Yeah. Just to position myself to where I had no other obligations other than to take care of a bunch of cows and, and, uh, wife and family and dogs and cats and chickens and a couple of random sheep and a goat or two and, a, and basically and, what Raleigh did is nearly impossible yes <laughs> to summarize thank you Richard yeah I was able to Raleigh's know, like say what yeah well I do I don't have much of a back left but I I started pay delivery business and well, your front's not much to look at either so yeah well you know I, hey oh yeah it was about 2,500 tons a year of small bales delivered yeah. to people and, and just a lot of hard work and, and persistence and honesty and integrity and keeping your word. And just, yeah, you know, it probably took one of the most labor-intensive jobs around and made it his own and, and really, really built a solid uh, trust-based integrity business out of that. And that's what led him to his next – level of goals was was being that guy especially in in your county uh from that part of the world only you have is your word man and you were that guy that rolled in and and really uh i think sort of proved yourself to who you said you were from your hard work and your sort of uh integrity which is pretty cool because not many folks can go do that no and 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 you know, Richard being in and out of the cow business a couple times now, it, it's a difficult thing to, to uh, enter into, especially, you know, without having uh, family ties or uh, and well, in somewhere for pasture. Uh, it, starting from scratch is damn near impossible. Yeah. What do you have to do, actually? I've been wondering that. Do you have to, <clears throat> you said Richard started three herds, so I, I presume. I was looking, like I always had on separate occasions. I, I was <clears throat> do you like have to have a significant amount of money and buy a herd? Is that what you do? Or what well, do you do? two challenges. How do you start? You gotta one? get the cattle and you gotta get the land. I always well, have that's, the that's, that's that's a great point, Richard. There's two major components. You get dirt and you got cows. And well, you, okay, so you have dirt. Well, that's, How do that's, you get so yeah, cows? well, either A you're gonna lease or buy the dirt, or you're gonna lease or buy the cows or you're going to start super small and probably buy 50 head and a hundred acres. You know, there's, there's considerable financial investment on either side. So most likely you're going to buy the cows and lease the dirt usually just because there's, it, it just depends on the situation you might stumble upon. Really, I guess is the best way to put it, but they're both, extremely considerable investments one hopefully uh returning a greater volume every year i.e being i buy 100 cows this year and if i do it right i might have 150 next year so i just think i i would, I would guess if you were to ask me i would guess you'd need like a <clears> million dollars to start no, not out. necessarily. Yeah, um, yeah buy it. well, I guess you buy at least the land, so I guess that takes. Actually, that I think long. if you had a million dollars to start, you wouldn't make it. No, I totally agree. You got totally to learn. Make it. You have to learn how to make it. You, you got to learn to make it on better. nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like start to start. Three, I, I like start to start with, in first place. I started. I, with, I start with three head. Yeah, exactly. And then That's I start with twenty two head, and then I start with eighty six head. Exactly. So, it's one of the few addictions i'm not going to say hobbies or activities i'm going to say addictions where your results bring more results literally like you might love acid but you can never take acid it's not going to make more acid you love cows if you do it right your cows make more cows that's the great thing about this cow addiction is if you do it right you can have more every year you can get rid of some and have some more new ones. If you only have like three to start, isn't that incestuous? Don't get have on details. How's that work? <laughs> no. You can always get another you can get another bowl. You can buy bread heifers from two or three different people for one. 
that's the yeah. cheap way to start. Like somebody's got a bread heifer sale. I'm buying one from this guy, one from this guy, one from this guy. Now I've got three different yeah. lines of cows coming into my herd. They're all pregnant when I buy them. And you know, yeah, within one to six months, they're going to calve. So now I've got, I started with three head. Now I've instantly got six. There, um, there's several ways to, to look at succeeding in the cow business. Um, well, that's a great thing about it. It's in, different in my opinion, definition for everybody. Like, what I, where I started in the hay business, I learned an invaluable lesson that carries into the cow business. For sure. That is, there's money to be made <clears throat> on how you feed your cows. Yeah. And I was fortunate to have a lot of connections and be able to find really cheap feed especially when it comes to winter time because we i live in an area where we feed cows for five months out of the year so that that's being able to do that as an asset to your business um however you, marketing marketing cattle is probably not my strong suit in this business at this point it's still learning still getting into it. but what saved my bacon is that my costs have been significantly reduced because I did know how to find cheap feed and, and ultimately led me into to a, a lease on a place where I raise my own now. Which yeah. on, on average in the West, though, up to at least 60% of your annual costs, total costs, are winter feeding. That's, that's insane. That's, that's where saving 5% on your overall average feeding cost changes your complete business model. And I think not to get off on a, another random soapbox, but the fact that you approach it as a business model and not that this makes me super happy and this is what I want to go do every day. That's great and all, but it has to be a business. So when you approach it like Raleigh did and like Richard has, where I can find a way to feed cheaper given this stuff or on this land, et cetera, then you increase your chances to be around the next year because you found a way to cut your inputs and still get a good output. I think that's the key component. And I think that's why it's so cool to see what you guys are doing because neither one of you, I mean, that's why I wanted both of you on this podcast because you both run cows, but, very differently for sure and you're different regions and you have different markets and you have different goals and i think that's one of the cool things about it and i'm glad we get to discuss a bit deeper sometimes is you guys both run cows and that's how you make a living but it, it it's completely different in how you do it you have different regions you have different goals management styles and that's awesome i think that's the best part about the whole deal raleigh's sort of the hedgehog say that you're more of the hedgehog. Somebody asked me last year who of the jackasses in ADL that overextended himself on cattle. I said, well, that'd probably be me. <laughs> yeah, like the lion forms to the left. You know, like who the hell asked that question? Like uh, we're all having <laughs> breakfast there every day from 7 to 8.30, a-hole. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, I I think about it and it's like that. my favorite part is building, <sighs> starting from just a few heads and building them up. That's amazing. My herd gets better every time I do it. And I have a relative. Hold on. Let me stop you His right name there. Is, uh, Bronco Jack McAuliffe. You don't know what mm -hmm. I Can I stop you right when you just said? I'm stopped. I'm, I'm, but there's a slight delay. <laughs> I apologize. You just said your herd gets better every time you do it. Why is that? Um, I would say that, well, I have a. Now I have a idea what my market is and I, I don't, I, it just drives me crazy. Like that, everybody has so many different philosophies, but it's all about the poundage that you deliver and doesn't, you don't need a $60,000 so every year. Yeah. Yeah. You still pounds. Um, you, don't need, you can deliver the same amount of poundage with a $5,000 bowl as you can with a $20,000 bowl. And really the market doesn't, discriminate on how much you spend on your bull in the long run. It's not what very you often. Deliver. No. Yeah. So 
I mean, there's a game where you can play in the purebred business. So that's not my game. My that's, game is that's total pound different. And now my now my game is total poundage of grass fed beef hung on the hook, mm -hmm. and in the right thing. So those cattle aren't the most beautiful looking cattle, but they do have uh, the yeah they do deliver what my end product needs to be, and we're getting better at managing those type of cattle. And what I, one of the things, the biggest thing that Akiyushi's taught me is um, you can bitch about the breed all you want, but what it really comes down to is to your management style. Do so, you still find yourself adhering to, from, from strictly a carcass quality standpoint, which is still <clears throat> probably part of your program. Hmm. And, you, and you talk about buying bulls, and, and this is a curiosity of mine. At what point do you say, you know what, I don't need that expensive of a bull to still meet the standard I'm trying to uh, mm -hmm. produce? That's a critical I, component to all management. The interesting thing, and my, Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, they're finding that 70% of your, compos your composition of your herd comes from the maternal side. Yeah. So, why are you spending thirty? Why are you spending eighty percent of your money on thirty percent of what you uh, to get? You should be spending your money on your maternal side. That's the side that you well, need to build. I think that's the side components. that carries. But that's the side. The the dam carries the most genetics. Certainly, yes. A, my always my. Sorry, Joel, to get way off in the fucking dirt here. Question number one is always. What are your management goals? I don't care if it's nutrition, if it's feeding, if it's genetics, genomics, whatever. Question one, where are you at? Where are you trying to go? That's, that's all you need to think about. I don't care what tools you have in front of you. Let me put it in a different way. What are you trying to build? Is it a desk? Is it a house? Is it a wall? Is it a driveway? Is it a pickup? then I can give you the right tools to, to freaking build that thing. If you don't know, oh, behave. Mine's sleeping on the couch. Like, if you don't know what you're trying to get to, I can't give you the right tools. If you know, like Richard and Raleigh have both identified, where I'm trying to get, then here's your toolbox of what can make your job easier. Raleigh, is there a peanut butter ball nut? You got a pretty good smile on your face. Oh, I got it. I got an obnoxious mutt hounding me. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. Um, so that, that those are critical. Like it really boils down to management for one. Like, what are you trying to get done? Where are you at? Where do you want to go? I think that's critical. And I think when you guys, as soon as you figure that out and you put tools around you to make that work, all the more better. I, I just think I, I didn't mean to get off on a huge sidetrack, but that's what always rings true with me in my world is. Hey, I got a ton of tools to get you where you want to go. But if you don't know what you're trying to do and where you're at now, I really can't help you. I mean, I might, but you won't even realize it. So that's step one. And I think that's the critical component to all this stuff is where are you and where do you want to get to? And what do you have to do that with? You know, that's, that's all, all adds up. So knowing that is huge. We started this conversation with American Graffiti in high school. Congratulations, boys. You should be proud. Yeah. <laughs> Joel's like, Joel's like, what in the L? <laughs> I, I think we should, uh, I think it is. This is supposedly. Back into. And What's that? Come back to on a different topic. It's a, this is a great topic to segue back into on a different uh, track. Podcast and get back to our, our schedule, but. No, I think these are, these are awesome conversations. I love when we get off, uh, quote unquote, off track, talking about cows, talking about decisions, talking about management and the options. Those are all great. I think that's, that's, that's what a large part of our audience wants to hear about, sad enough, or oddly enough, or congratulations enough, is why we got the choices we have. But Joel, you were saying something, and I'm not sure what it was, and maybe one yeah. day we don't. Well, you were you were talking about goals, 
and stuff. And I was thinking yeah. that in that industry, there's probably when people talk about what their goal is, I would think, you know, I would automatically be like, well, I want to, I want to make shit ton of money. I want to get rich off of this. Well, <laughs> but I would guess in the cattle business, history. there's a lot of people who are just like, I just want to like build a good living. They don't necessarily have a goal of being like the biggest cattle rancher in Oregon. Right. Oftentimes, be hard um, to do. I can't tell you how many times. That was one of the first questions I asked my customers when I was doing nutrition. What's your goal? They would always, almost without fail, say, I want to raise, I want to have good mama cows. Yeah. My response okay. is always like, great. What does that mean? <laughs> Shit. Uh, well, really um, shooting for the stars there. Well, you know, okay. if that's oh, your living, that's what you're shooting for is, A, you want a calf every freaking year. It's like, I want to make a good mama cows. Outstanding, Earl. What does that mean to you? How do I quantify a good mama cow? Is it efficiency? Is it ROI? Like, there's, a, there's so many thousand ways. Like, if I ask Raleigh what a good mama cow is and I ask Richard what a good mama cow is, they have different answers. Because they raise cows in different here. parts of the country and they have different management goals. So that was the easy part of my Like my job was like, can you explain that on a deeper <laughs> level? Like, what does that mean? Like, it's like you saying, I want to be happy in my job. Okay, Mr. Joel, what does that mean? Does that mean working from anywhere? Does it mean autonomy? Does it mean three hour lunch break? Does it mean never happen to show up? What, what the hell does that mean to you? Like, yeah happy in my job well congratulations what does that mean to you and how does that translate to success I don't, and that's the great thing about cows well in, in in agriculture in general i don't think there's an industry anywhere where people wake up with a passion for what they do every day um yeah and maybe i'm wrong maybe joel you wake up and say i want to be a banker or the best or damn honor than i can be yeah yeah and, and maybe you do i don't know uh, it's for the, sure the, it's different you know that oh, well you can sit there and talk about how you know what what are my goals in a cow herd what do i want in a cow herd and there's goals surrounding that too i mean the, i don't think we're all that indifferent from from People in the in the, you know, we all want to make money, but it's a business. It's a business. How much how much happiness does that provide for you? I mean, people who have all the money in the world tend to be the most unhappy people there are. But it, you, you if know, you got the right business, you got some freedom. I think that's why you do it, right? At the end of the day, <laughs> we work seven days a week, and but we enjoy what we do. You're free, so, Richard. What you're dying to say something. Successful. Every successful oil man, the only thing he wants to do when he gets up in the morning is get up, go to the rig, and start drilling some oil wells. Yep. So he might be in an office in Tulsa, or he might be in an office in Houston, but he 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 just wants to drill some. He wants to get some footage to drill some oil wells, and he doesn't care if he makes money or not. That's what he does. That's that's the only I thing. I drill wells. Yeah. Yeah. And every time I the time time I was in the oil field, it never got old. Going to drill well, going on those rigs and drilling oil is one of the most. I mean, it's a lot like being in agriculture. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, you know, uh, it's I can imagine. Below 110, but those everybody in the oil field shows up just so they could drill some footage, just and, drill uh, some more. Yeah, I wish amazing. Marty Campbell was on here right now because Marty always had the best joke for this. When you and screw one goat. Yeah, fuck one goat. Yeah, you know, and it just goes oh, back. Oh, oh, to all that. Yeah. First time for me. I'm gonna interrupt the podcast. If my <laughs> if I don't pee right now, my hair's gonna get wet. So Good. you continue with the best Marty Campbell jokes ever. <laughs> I'm gonna run from my chair to the front porch and pee like a racehorse. And I'll be <laughs> back. 
<laughs> quick, fast, and in a hurry. But honestly, I thought I could make it to the end, but we got at least 45 minutes, and there's no way in hell I'm going to do that. But you continue with that Marty Campbell story, and I'll be right back. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. Just saying. You. We don't want to hear you pee. 30 seconds to tell us he has to pee. Gosh, it just got quiet. Where'd Micah go? I don't, I don't think this would be a Marty, Marty Campbell approved cast. <laughs> oh, I think we'll have to Marty set a different laugh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I guess getting back to Joel's movie, Richard, what was your um, take on the movie? What, what, what did you get from it? I always loved it. I watched it probably 10 or 15 times. So, um, and every time I watch it, it's like the older I get, the more some, I take something different out of it every time. Yeah. But what I do see is what people have stolen from it. Like if you, if you look at a Ron Howard movie, there's a little bit of American graffiti in every one of his movies, mm-hmm. I think. Um, that sort of the way it was cut and the, who, the sort of, I got a question for you who did Dazed and Confused because I found a lot of similarities in that yeah it's R- Richard Linkletter and I would imagine that he did he is sort of he does sort of because have you ever seen the so there's a it's like a there's Dazed and Confused there's a Boyhood and then there's a Everybody Wants Some or everybody wants some, the 80s baseball movie that he did. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, he focuses on different times and different people's lives in different decades. So very much the same style. And then the other thing I got a kick out of is uh, if there's any question where Quentino got the styling for his soundtracks in his movie, you don't have to look much harder than American Graffiti because having Wolf oh, Ninja women all through it it's it's he definitely stole that from lucas in that movie direct correlation and, and like he even described it like basically like you know four or five montages with music and and a bit of story sprinkled in and then there's even some direct scenes that that, that correlate one-to-one with with that it was it was amazing and the importance of the cars mm. and that movie was filmed in petaluma so um, yes, they had been in um, another town to the south. They got kicked out after one day, and Petaluma said, "Come on up, kids!" And so um, they did. And, and even the um, the final race scene, you know, it was in the early morning hours. Took them about two weeks to finally get filmed because they had to. They had this like you know from five fifteen to five forty five window every day to get that filmed and, and that car uh, Harrison Ford's 55 Chevrolet was was so well built and race worthy that it, it took several stuntmen even to get a chance to roll over in the filming because it was so well built and, and uh, widespread so yeah they had uh, a lot of times even the final scene uh, Ron Howard and Sidney Williams were kind of relaxing and trailing. We need you out there now. We got the sunset. The sunrise is coming up. We just wrecked the car. You have to get out there. And it's, they improvised a whole lot of that movie, too. So it was, it was pretty cool to see that part. Did you notice how I, – I was also wondering from watching that movie, I was like, how did Harrison Ford ever get famous? He is such a bad actor oh, in that movie. At, at this point, he was a carpenter. Well, and I was going to say, is that, this his first movie? Uh, I think it was I – mean, his – Second, he'd done some other minor part. Really? And so Francis uh, Ford Coppola had used funny. him as uh, he'd been a, he, he really tried to act <laughs> once and went back. He was basically building sets and it's making, making decent money in time as a carpenter. He had, I guess at the time he had two kids to support. I think he was in Kelly's in. They, What's that? He's in Kelly's Heroes, I think. Yes. And they, they talked him into taking this movie um who's and, got the next and, movie by the way what's that who has the next movie me. by the way i do yeah i think you just had a great recommendation well i already know what it's going to be it's not it's not anything you probably wouldn't expect now but it's going to be a good one yeah so it's a window 
And so, yeah, Harrison was like doing carpentry and like fully satisfied being the carpentry dude. And they talked him into taking this role as Bob Falfa in the badass 55. So, and uh, yeah. Was there anybody else in this movie that was in Star Wars? I don't, I, no, I don't think so. Um, I thought about that for a second, but uh, behind the scenes, yes, but not actually on the film, no. I was just wondering. I think Richard Dreyfus was the, never mind, I'll do a little research, but I think he might have been one of those bad Star Wars movies that have been forgotten about. Yeah. Like the Ewok well, Adventure movie. So the, um, the, the casting director for this movie, for, for Graffiti, uh, they did literally months of casting and rehearsals and and uh, trials and this and that and the other. Um, and so he'd worked with a lot of these folks on other movies and seen them at different times and brought them all back for specific purposes and reasons. So it was really cool to see how all these folks ended up. And it's like, when you look back now, like you can't picture, in me, at least me, I can't picture anybody else in some of these roles like, the Ron Howard role, the Richard Dreyfus role. Like Richard Dreyfus got offered both his role and the Ron Howard role when he took the movie, which is like completely different parts. It's so crazy to think that he could have played Ron Howard's part. That's just mind blowing. Um, and some of the folks they had to find to get to do the roles they did. It's just a and, and really all the struggles to get the movie made, the rewrites they did, the people. It took like, it took over five years to get this movie from conception to when it actually got filmed. And even then it was like rewritten like two weeks before it started shooting um, because the original people that he wanted to write the movie were already committed several times. And so it was just, it was crazy. I, I literally watched an hour and a half uh, making of, um, as part of the, the deal to get the background for this. It was really cool. So, and, and it, it just the really struck to, about cruising. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to say, but it was sort of critical that and sort of fortuitous that um, it ended up in Petaluma. Is that's where the cheeseburger was created. Yes. A cool. lot of a lot of great cruising in, in Petaluma is also in uh, yeah. drag racing and et cetera. Yeah. So, that was sort of the center of the whole culture in the first. <laughs> Like drive-throughs was where you could get hamburgers. Most sort definitely, of all yeah. Came from there, so yeah, it was uh, just I, I I echo what Mike has said from living in Lakeview and like driving up and down the street in the '90s, which it's amazing that we're still doing it 30 years later. And when just, we got bored, we would go over to Klamath and cruise. So that was a total wreck. But yeah, um, never no. no good, no good came of that. Yeah, it was no. Like that was the I, a. There was no texting. It was a freaking phone call. Dan, my best friend. Hey, you want to go cruise around? Yeah, sounds good. And we just fucking drive around, listen to music. You get your best ACDC cranked up. It's fucking. It's like fucking thirty-two degrees outside. You get the windows down, heater cranked up. Just wash your pickup fucking ACDs cranking out the window and you're just driving around and you'd see somebody and you'd fuck, hey! And then, then all them gals jump in your rig and you're driving around together. Like, it was like a, it's magic, man. There's there's no short-sighting cruising around. It's just the best in, shit in high school, ever. It was, what, it was what the stories that were talked about on Monday and Tuesday and by Wednesday, you were planning for the next Friday. The next, so. yeah, yeah. Monday, Tuesday, build up. Wednesday was, was sort of middle ground. And then from Joel, then on, you're you planning the next. Yeah. What year did you graduate? What's that? When did you graduate? 2000, 2001. Okay, so you were getting into the cell phone era. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't. We drove around, but that was like mm. earlier high school. Mm. Later in high school, we just would go somewhere and drink. Yeah. See, we didn't do I the was, driving, cruising stuff. I will say it out loud. I, I graduated high school in 1992, which you don't have shoes that old. Uh, you couldn't buy shoes that old on eBay right now. 
uh, so 90, 91, 92, it was the full effect of just driving around and music or flares or randomness or just saying, hey, and just pulling over. And it was like a, it was a distinct culture. There was numerous phone calls from me and my friend Dan, like, you want to go cruising around? Yeah, sure. And then like, you ride in somebody's pickup for a while, then you switch off and ride somebody else's because the, you're running out of gas. Where was the hub in Lakeview? No, like, it was where most, did you go? most definitely was the Safeway parking lot right across the street from the cop shop of all places. But that was the, yeah. that was the main gathering shifting point was you know, Safeway parking lot. You know what's kind of interesting, and I, I can say this because – listening to my Where'd you guys go really well it when we were in high school it was kind of dean's deli oh yeah and, for sure so but my parents generation they did the same thing they they cruised main street but they all met oh, yeah. up they met right up on the street where your brother brian lives now oh that everybody parked up there on north north on, main uh, yeah. north main and that was where everybody met and then they go cruise the Sure. the gut they call it and so we call it we call it dragging the gut yeah yeah it's interesting that for for 40 40 years almost the 60s 70s 80s and part of the 90s yeah that, that at least in most i'm and I'm, I'm assuming a lot of small america was kind of a trend amongst i mean guarantee to you Absolutely. I don't. I don't think anybody in rural America could watch this movie and not have some sort of a connection. Oh, no, that's why it costs like just under like three quarters of a million to make, like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and, and I mean millions because of that exact thing. And it was, it's one of the first movies that when he wrote the movie, he had specific uh, music points or montages in his in his mind and actually put it in parentheses while he wrote the scenes like in a got a Vita or whatever it was like playing during this time like it completely shifted movie making at that point like when you know exactly the the theme song you want in the background like when you write a scene that was unheard of at this point and that's what he did it's so cool it still took years to get made, yeah. But it just resonated with anybody who was basically from 15 to 55 when the summit got, holy shit, look at intellectual Bradbury. Wow, that's fucking spooky. Wow. This man's doing, hey, Pythagoras, what are you doing? Yeah, the sum of an isosceles triangle is the inverse of the uh, hypotenuse. Yeah, look at this fucking guy. <laughs> what I mean, I didn't notice you were wearing glasses, Richard. Good day, sir. Yes. <laughs> Hashtag LASIK. Yeah. Oh, I see they have lenses too by the reflection. I thought that might have been fake to begin with. Not above you. Yeah. Joel, do you wear glasses? What? Joel, Only when he's do you wear glasses? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I wear contacts. Oh. Okay. I can't keep can't keep track of my glasses. Um yeah. Somehow yeah, you back to the movie. keep track of invisible know. shit to put in your eye, but you can't keep track of glasses. What the shit does that mean? <laughs> Anyways, yes, you were saying? Uh, I don't know. I was just trying to get us back on the movie. You kind of went off the went land, way, uh, I, We went glasses. way off track. I went pee to come back. We're talking about graffiti, which I thought was very impressive. And I thank you guys for your efforts there. Um, I think it was the it was like the early modern early day version of um, I just lost the word I was looking for in the name of the movie. Dazed and confused. Thank you, my good sir. Yes, Raleigh already brought that up. Yeah. Oh, that must have been my during my penis handling <laughs> yep. session during yeah. your pee break. Yeah, I had to go choke the kitten for a while. Yeah. Days and Confused is still one of the modern day classics, but yeah, a lot of carryover between the two, and 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 our actually our growing up experiences also. There's a lot of ruffians in those two realms. What uh, any final thoughts on the movie, and then uh, I had a poop. Kind of 
Excellent. I appreciate you for moving us on there. Uh, well, I, I was like, yeah, but I, I was just quickly going to ask, like, you guys grew up and rem remember really well the 80s. I don't remember the 80s, but do you feel nostalgia when you look back at, like, Back oh. to the Future, Dude, 1985, where you're oh like, oh, fuck, yeah. yeah, that was a cool time. Dude, or, that, fucking you know really Toyota, like, that, that fucking Toyota pickup in Back to the Future was the tits. Probably still gets, has sir. one of those. The tits. Sweet yeah, Lord of Mighty and fucking KC Daylighters. Remember the fucking covers of the old thing? Like the Daylighter covers? Oh my God, dude. That fucking 85 Toyota, like on 33s, was the shit, Maynard. Oh my God. You know, okay, so Mike and Mrs. the 80s. What about you guys? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, durr. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we all have a. A connection to the era that we grew up in. Sorry, Richard. And, but, you know, the the 80s were was a good decade. Um, well, some of the 90s and the 20s and dude, I every fucking year we're alive is better than the last decade. It might be different, but it's better. It's Shit, never Earl. I think, we have cell phones now. How cool is that? Like in the 70s and um, 80s, we had we had. You had to limp your ass to the next neighbor's house to call anybody. I mean, it was like, it was Good. awful. Like, I don't have any. Sometimes I had a motorcycle or bike wreck, and I was like three quarters of a mile from the neighbor's house. I had to limp my ass and drag my bike to there and knock on the fucking door and try to get a phone call. And, and are you on the same party line as we are? Because if you are, I have to dial 6 7. And if you're not, I can just dial a regular freaking number. To please get the station where I'm going to come get my ass because. I wrecked big time. Yeah, it sucked. I don't know. I think it. Uh, like his day started at four thirty, ladies and gentlemen. Apparently, yeah, it was awful. Yeah. No, that was two thirty. Um, I In think a.m. Uh, yeah. I think uh, there's good to the world that we grew up in the '80s, and there's good to the world no that doubt. we grew up there, that we're in oh. now, and we. We could certainly learn a lot still from them. Um, I would concur. But, yeah. but that's enough about the, the uh, American. Well, uh, I think this is a phenomenal time to enter me to interject uh, a bit o advertisement from our good friends at BK Auto. And just a quick little Richard has to boop. That's cool. Um, let me give a little being King Auto update, and I will just say, hey, got scrap? Get paid. You know, from Grandma's freezer to Grandpa's old piece of shite tractor slash mower, these are just some of the things that B&K will purchase. Cars, copper, brass, aluminum. That's how the foreigners are saying it. Uh, batteries, old equipment even catalytic converters, which is sort of like making their own energy. Electric motors and such. Just call B&K Auto Salvagers, look them up on the old interweb, and they will give you all the pleasure you can ever desire from those activities. So get down to B&K Auto Salvage. There you go, kids. Richard got an iced tea and a towel full of something in Raleigh. Well, it's not talking about Raleigh, did. So, do we have time to to go over um, we sure, any we, important news in the world with the election well, coming up with uh, Biden and Trump and those fellows? Well, I I'd like to jump in front of that if I could. You know, we usually have word of the week and yada yada yada. But given our time of the year and our current status, I would like to talk about the recent confirmation of ACB. Miss Amy Kona Barrett, if you will, who just got uh, last night, for those of you playing along at home, uh, I think it was 52 to 48. She got passed by or confirmed, if you will. And then uh, I was in the Senate. And then later on that same evening, uh, Judge uh, Clarence Thomas swore her into the Supreme Court. And 
I'm going to keep the um, gauntlet here for a second. I'm under my watch and just really saddens me to no degree that a person who I feel is very qualified to be on the court um, was treated so horribly and, and literally voted against. It was literally 52 to 48. Um, it was direct party line vote. Um, the 48 people voted against this person. It was merely because she was appointed by a Republican slash conservative president. Uh, and, and also I've heard amongst the crowd in the country this back week, that she's a, a conservative uh, Catholic, which apparently makes her one of the most evil people in the world. And I, I will just repeat my utter disdain for the fact that a person's qualifications to go on the Supreme Court are so tightly correlated to A, the person who nominates her, and B, for some, some reason, what her religion might be impacts her judicious uh, aptitude, if you will. So it saddens me to a tremendous degree that this person who appears in all all aspects that I can see, uh, tremendously qualified for this role, was instantly disqualified in 48 people, 48 people in the Senate who, amongst all traditional um, oversight, are some of the most formed intellectuals, and this fucking pains me to say that, found her unworthy. They voted against her. They didn't Hold say... On a they didn't, oh, down let me, let me finish. This they didn't say she mean. wasn't the this... best person for the job. They physically voted against her nomination. 15, yeah, they do that all the time. 48. No, they, bullshit. Republicans voted against Elizabeth My Hagen. Ass. Hagen. Dude, oh, man. Ruth, let's go back to RGB, the fucking matriarch of the Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Well, there's like what two yeah. or three people who voted against her for fuck's sake, literally. I don't know. It was a tremendous no. overswell, and it was not a Republican controlled anything. Like she was deemed fucking worthy to be on the court. Most of the time in the past, you skip back about 15 years, most of the court candidates were passed by a supreme majority. Like seriously, there was no reason to vote against them because. They were decent fucking judges. It was not a fucking, it's, it's never been a partisan vote. That's my point. Like, it shouldn't be. In my mind, it should be like three people with their blind judicial ratings come on the screen and say, which one you think's the best? And you don't know their name or their fucking gender or anything else. You just, like, pick the best fucking person from the whole group, and then you just vote them in. How crazy is that? But I guarantee you, Mr. Joel, when Ruth Bader was sworn in, that was during Clinton's administration, for fuck's sake. Yeah. That was a different That was a different time. I'm just looking that at... That not long uh, ago, dude. That was in the fucking 90s, for fuck's sake. It's in so here, history. Here, here we go. Sotomayor... Uh, confirmed by ranch. confirmed by a vote of sixty seven to twenty nine, so twenty nine people voted against her. Well, yeah, I uh, vote against her today. Thirty seven, thirty seven or something voted against uh, Kagan, yeah. and those were Obama nominations. So this nonsense, you got to be fair. Don't be a hypocrite Dude, here. Thirty nine against Republicans. Come on, man. Treated, it was not they a treated. It was they not. They treated Obama and his nominations like shit. It was not a distinct party line vote, though, on either of those votes you just mentioned. Correct? Yeah. Certainly it was. Probably goes, it, it probably goes not. to the. Uh, probably goes to the divisiveness. I'm, I'm looking at Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I had no idea. 96 yays, three nays, and one abstaining. Exactly. What year was that, Richard? 
Thank you. Yeah. Different, Different time. Time. Different era. Kick out of his, uh, Everybody what, just seems. What does that shit time. mean, Joel? Different time for fuck's sake. That it was, was Clinton's first term. What the what the hell are you talking was, about? It was thirty fucking years ago, dude. It was still Republicans and fucking Democrats. Like I voted in an election, man. It was serious to me. It's like different time. What the <laughs> shit does that mean? If that's You're a older different than you time, think you are. When does a different time <laughs> stop being a different time? What the fuck, man? Such, what does that mean? You're such a, such a boomer. <laughs> Proudly. Oh. I mean, shit, Earl. Like, that was a different time. Well, then what changed, <laughs> you commie bastards? What the fuck changed? What? I should uh, not uh, even remotely matter who nominates a judge, man. I swear to I, I don't care which side nominates a judge. I don't. It shouldn't matter. Look at the record, how they interpret the Constitution. That's what you should question them on. I, I mean, I didn't think that it's I really, voted, I would have voted not really to sad. prove her. Why? Tell me. There, there's already two well, women on yeah, there. Yeah, literally That's two it. women already in the court. Yeah. We got we got enough. Listen, <laughs> I'm just you, kidding. Now, you know now, you I, are a home. Why would you not put no. this person on the Supreme Court? I was opposed to this because I thought uh, Obama deserved to to put some uh, that person Dude. Garland on when he when he had the chance. A, I, I thought I think it's okay. clearly hypocritical, but he if had, you're going to go to sleep at night, be okay with that. It's fine. It's the point. But it's Obama still, had, Obama can't deny had, it's hypocritical. Obama had eight years to get somebody on there. He could have easily talked it doesn't Ginsburg matter. You're into required to serve those eight years, not seven. You're supposed to get eight. Oh, so if you agree that a presidential term is a full eight years, not just six and a half, unless there's a Supreme Court nomination. You know what? Ginsburg could have resigned any time during Obama's term and gave him a, another nominee easily. Yeah, I agree. But guess what? Of she course, fucking hung on her. for some reason. I don't know why, but she did. So he couldn't. And they couldn't win the Senate, so pound sand. Like seriously, like he can. Hey, uh, this is Barack. Uh, you could uh, resign any time, and that'd be cool. And I, I don't know anything else. He could talk her into it, but she was like hanging Dude, on I'm for just, fucking something else. I'm just I'm not saying. Sure what. I'm just saying. I'd like people to be able to better recognize when. <clears throat> so Republicans are very hypocritical, and so are Democrats. But they don't they don't see it on the other side at all, or or they just choose to ignore it. Let me, but let me pause you, you can't this. deny that. Let me, let me pause right here. So, do you think that she should have been nominated to the court at this time? Question one. Uh, I'm, well, I don't. So have RBG a yes died. Answer, I, I'd say RBG died. They're within. They're with. They're within their rights to do it, but the set precedent, recent precedent with Obama, Obama makes them hypocrite. The if that's they're willing bullshit. to wear that, that's fine. Precedent? If you have a Democratic president and Republican Senate and House, fuck your precedent. You, there's no way you're going to pass it. That's why you don't make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. The that's situation's the not exactly the same. You're, you're always going to be able to find some, something that's to like, differentiate and you, support your... Can you tell me? Richard would like to say goodnight to you guys. Oh, R three squared. Good night. Good night. Okay, you get you get. Bienvenidos, mi vamano. You know he's trying to say that, but he can't. So we'll get there soon. Have a hug. Not the first time that that house has many memories of. Early morning activities. Yes. yes. Tomorrow morning. Okay, buddy. Okay. So you guys know my position on that. Raleigh, well, what what did you make of that? What do you hold think? on? Well, well, let me let me clarify a couple things. I, we know Micah's position, you know mine. Let me double clarify a couple things. I I I, I just want to go back a couple notches and be like, dude, um if Obama would have had the Senate in the House. He had to push through every crackhead possible, but he didn't, so he couldn't. So, gee, 
Dude, that's, we okay. had that's the not presidency. how they framed it though. Yes, it is exactly how they framed it. Like Christ. you have the presidency in the Senate, you can go pound sand otherwise. I know you do, but that's not but how, how they framed disagree? it. They framed it mean? as like we don't replace we don't replace uh, the judges in an election year. That's how McConnell well, what the fuck are you that talking shit. about? That never occurred in the Constitution. They said if you have that, it's the president's right to nominate a vacancy. No, it how, falls upon okay, the so Senate. Okay, so Obama didn't get to do that because McConnell. Because gonna Chuck Schumer changed the whole. Oh well, yeah, don't talk to me. Because <laughs> Schumer changed the goddamn filibuster rule. That's why. I think that we're. That's what, I think that we're. we're, we're my main point we're is. In, let me let me let me skip lead. ahead to the end. We had a Republican president, a Republican Senate. There was an open seat in the Supreme Court. It's within his right to fill that seat that's in the Constitution. So we did. We didn't change any rules. That. We didn't break any precedent. We didn't do anything illegal. There was none of this. All these buzzwords are getting passed around by Super Chuck and all these other assholes. There's no illegitimacy or rules broken or anything else. Like this is fully within the spectrum of the Constitution. What's your problem? I think, yeah, Raleigh. We're, we're in, we're in the weeds. We're in the weeds. Um, if you take it at this 30, point, 000, though, it's fully appropriate. Well, I think that we're. If you're pulling us out of the weeds, we have serious issues. <laughs> no, but uh, this is the this is by design that this is what we're quibbling over. Exactly, dude. And it's just I, the whole it's point, not, the whole structure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not, and it's. Both sides are equally guilty of a complete they both, lack. Of they both fucked the system up beyond repair. The Democrats and started with like the. With that. I want to hear what I want to hear what Richard has to say. He's we'll an intellectual, on. somewhat disappointing. Keep interrupting. <laughs> disagreeing, like they start quote unquote. They started it, you know. So go ahead, go ahead, Richard, please. It's, it's the, we're just it's the, we're getting we're just feeding into we're just throwing feel on the fire arguing about this kind of stuff she was perfectly capable and 100%. when we were talking when we were talking about ruth bader Ginsburg or anything i think it's sad that we completely don't in the media have any coverage of sandra day o'connor mm-hmm. i mean there was lots of trail breaking and uh trailblazing that went on and you can see that it was definitely played to one particular tone and um it's the tone that is in, it's this, uh, it has to do with this whole new, uh, what are they calling it now? The reimagining of the economy and the reimagining of America. It's a whole dialogue. So for your ass, you were going to say new normal because I would come to this screen. <laughs> but Stomp has no mud hole on March there, there is a 20% of the population is behind this cultural shift in the United States. And well, it's yeah, the, 100% people, 20% economy. Fucking pound sand. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's been very effective and it's causing the rest of the 80% of us to fight about stuff that we should never fight about. And if we are we come to the conclusion that our senators and congressmen are basically dysfunctional, I, there's nothing to fight over. They're all corrupt. And uh, I swear to yeah. Christ, I've never been more convinced. I've always been the person that says we have term limits in place. We can vote people out anytime we choose. That was my naive Pollyanna point of view. As I've lived, and I was deeply involved in the system for many years as I've evolved and transferred. I'm like, you know what? The system is self-perpetuating with these cornhole and bastards. And there's no fucking way that the system is going to allow or implement a new person 
every once in a while. Like you think about your average, it doesn't matter the party, a new person wants to get involved in a national level or even regional level politics. Unless you have the national parties, one of these, you know, I get any funding. You're really, really what are you? Tits up in the frog pond. So I have become a convert into the fact of term limits. And I, I think one of the main things, and I just talked about this night to my friends, was like, it's not right. The existing president gets to fly around on Air Force One and when he's still being president run for a second term i'm like it should be like a random number like a seven year one term deal there's no re-election like you get seven years because you have four years house or two years house six years senate and then you have seven years presidency you just go do your thing there's no re-election process and the whole point being is like you show up you do your time and you fuck off and go home because there's no way in hell that you should ever show up being poor as hell, i.e. 40 grand in net worth. And when you walk out 50 fucking years later, worth 17 to 55 million, that's a problem. And you can't point to one senator or rep right now who's not done that. And that's fucked up. That's not right. I don't give a shit what side of the aisle you're on. You should never walk into the house or the Senate worth $300,000 and walk out 50 years later worth $350 million. How does that happen? Not legitimately. So at one point I thought, well, we can just vote people out. That's our term limits. Doesn't happen. Our system is not built for us to find new people to be replaced. So there's no way around it the fact that you need to have term limits, be it three years or five years for the House, and six years for the Senate, maybe eight years for president, and there's no repeat ever. You're fucking done. I think that's what has to happen. As sad as it is because do you think system- uh do you think Biden will even? Well, sorry, I'm not going to change the subject. Yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, probably, we are I so still, far I, off the rails right now. You can talk yeah, about I know. fucking I still Legos. Hear, it wouldn't matter. I still want to hear what Raleigh thinks on the situation. And uh, yeah. you repeat the situation so we can bring it back up to speed? So this is a conversation about I'm right? looking at my it's laptop right, and I don't know the exact topic that you're on right now. Yeah. How about just, Raleigh, what, do you, what are you thinking? If I could pause you real quick and just talk real briefly about our good friends at B&K Auto. Again? Dude, How they, bought, they bought at least three three spots per um, per show, man. All right, make, make it quick. It's not prom night, Joel. You just don't make it <laughs> over with and done, like bite my ear and get it over with, if you will. Just saying. Yeah. So, kids, if you have scrap type vehicles or if you're looking for parts with over 1200 used vehicles in stock and a large diverse impressive selection of 4x4 parts available that's consistently changing being chaotic salvage is your eastern oregon one-stop shopping in the automotive world so look them up online and stop by and tell them that far reaches sent you, yes, sons of bitches. So, as you were saying, so he had such important shit to talk about, and he has. I see an empty chair with Mister Joel. I see Richard with his orange ass hat and big ass glasses. Raleigh had to go poop, and there's me. You bastard, bastard, bastards. Yeah, Richard, I'm so proud you hung with us. And here you are. I guess could be happier. Yeah. And to quote Mr. Houchin, bastard, bastard, son of a bitch, bastard. And Joel's putting his pawns back in his ears for tamponelius items. Anyway, Mr. Joel, we read all of our uh, advertisements. And Rolly's back also. He's grabbing some Good. snacks. So Good. we're here. 
the question was, what do I think? Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. I think I think as a nominee, she is as good a qualified as we've had. Maybe, maybe there's others. Maybe is she a Ruth Bader? We'll see. In, no. As far as political lines, I really don't think that. <clears throat> I think we've gotten to a point in our country where when we're worried about the quality of person based on what we make them out to be when it comes to making a Supreme Court justice, we've lost sight of how our system works. I think that the the beauty of the judiciary is the non-bias that, that they can't play into the political hemisphere. Yeah. and. And I, I, I honestly believe that, you know, I heard Biden say it the other night in what, a speech, or maybe it was in his, in his debate, um, that we need to unite. There, there, is, there is no uniting when, when... It kills me. Yeah. Your political lines are so tightly drawn that mm. Just because you're on one side of the playground Dude. and they're on the other, you can't see things their way anymore. We've lost sight of what America is. And quite frankly, getting back to Micah's term limits, absolutely. We need to put term limits on these assholes because they're not there for the benefit of the people anymore. They're, they're for them. For they're they're for them. For and, them. Are you and, talking about on the Supreme Court? No. No, Senate, I'm talking about political House, Senate, the House and Senate, President. And, and the, oh, the bottom line is, if if I was sitting on the Democratic side of the of the of the aisle in the Senate, and the the character of a woman who they just passed through there, whether Lord. whether it's agree whether it's agreeable or not, the character of that person, if you cannot look through your political sunglasses and go, you know something, this is a pretty fair individual. This is someone who's not going to do what what we fear that we might do or that that we 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 lost track of how the only our, thing she did wrong was be nominated by a republican and and that though and it, that's it, it, it would not so matter. screwed up it, it would not matter if it was republican she she got nominated by donald trump but seriously yes and that's it, her it, major it, fault that's why 52 to 48 and how could any of those 48 people look you in the eye and say i voted against her because of x that's the problem the problem is that's so fucked if up she was on the other foot if the shoe was on the other foot and obama had the opportunity to make a nomination and the senate was stuck to democrats Oh. It would go just the same way because the Republicans are standing on just as thin ice as the Democrats are within our government. And, the, and, the, oh. and, it, and, it's, and it does not matter which side of the argument you're on here. The bottom line is, is we did end up with a good justice out of this for well, both sides. The please. fact is it should never, ever matter who nominates justice. Really. That's – it's – the problem – Regardless the problem, of – for a That's lot of, it, it, so I'll be honest with you. It really surprises me that the Republicans all voted for. Mm -hmm. As corrupt as they play ball in D.C. Them I'm fucking really the kneeled sons of bitches. Yeah. Always going to be I two or three that. fag off and go from the other side because, like, look at what, that asshole from Utah. Mitt Romney marching with Black Lives Matter. I, I, fucking kneeling down and marching with them sons of bitches. I'd fucking shoot him in the head before I'd revote for him. They're, they're, Ever. The the their their behavior impressive. You heard me. The, their behavior is is it's communistic. What, it's sad. It, it, it's it, un American. It, it, it's obstructive. It's injustice. It's yeah, assholishness. It's, it's fucking okay. unacceptable. All right. Let's hear it all. It's not what the 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 framers and and I can't help but sit here and look at where we're at today and think how they did that when they did it when they put the constitution and the network of our government together how they had the foresight to it see was 
mind blowing. In the, in, the foresight I alone. That, I think about that, and I think the ability to manipulate the system has been learned since then, and they've found a way to put division within America using our political parties. And, it, and it's none of this is good for America. At the end of the day, it's none of it's good for for the greatest country that's ever been ever. built. World. And, and and maybe maybe there's argument that it's the greatest country because it's certainly probably not now but at one point in time dude there's there nobody was, building on Earth. life and, rafts out of fucking bleach bottles and floating anywhere else to leave here and go know. somewhere I, else i think ever I think we'll solve a lot of problems if we would go ahead and and find a way, I don't know if you'll ever get a pass through the House or the Congress, is to put term limits on these guys. And because career polit pol politicians weren't designed to be careers, Dude, and they shouldn't be. I, I was only the staunchest opponent to term limits. Joel, ever. I want to know Joel's view on, on term limits. I'd be curious because. I was thousand percent against them forever. Uh, I, I would, I guess, it makes sense on a on a president, but I, th I feel like on a local state level, uh, I'm okay with them not having them. I feel like just like any job, you would get better at it. But My maybe that'd be the whole idea. You don't want somebody that's like ass. You don't Not want somebody that's so no. entrenched in the system that they know that's the loopholes, I guess. That that would yeah. be... So if everyone's playing by the same game, I, I'd be definitely comfortable with term limits. I'd, I'd, I'd support it. I would vote for it if it came up for a vote. It's mandatory. I, I was But on the Supreme Never Court, a lot of it. people have been talking about it on the Supreme Court, and I don't think that's a good idea because then you got judges... No, like no, ruling, that's different. Ruling dude, certain situations, dude, dude. considering their post career, post skill career. Even, <laughs> even our our beyond the dream speaker, Ruth Bader said, "I see no reason to change the Supreme Court from nine, um, ever." Yeah, so yeah. That's all don't said, don't fuck with the numbers of the Supreme Court. Yes, it is a life sentence for that that's because it's not it should not be daily involved in deciding right and wrong the house and the fucking senate make the rules and the supreme court says yeah that's legal or not they don't make the fucking rules that's the point of their whole thing yeah. about the system the house and the senate have their term limits the supreme court's for life because of that exact same region. I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. I was the most ever opposed to term limits. Ever. Because it's built into the system. If you don't like some bitch, you fucking vote them out. But guess what? Hey. We have so fucked up the system that the same asshole gets reelected again and again and again. And we get what we have now. Like fucking Harry Reid and fucking Chuck Schumer and Pelosi and all these assholes have been in there fucking 50 years? Go pound sand. Oh, I got a question Get the fuck for out of here. Richard, when it comes to these career politicians, do you, do you ever feel like they help to build or I don't want to say build they build a set of laws to kind of help enable their ability to stay within government. Like, do they, I, I don't, that's a very broad thought, but um, I guess what I'm saying is you take a Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi's district and, and it's heavily democratic and the, the laws that they um, write and put through, do you feel like it helps with, I don't want to call it their dictatorship, but their ability to remain in control in government. I think that the, this is, I think that we're struggling with an interesting time right now because this is the first time a generation has held power 
for the entire time because of the amount of time that people live now. So I don't think when the founders came up with the idea that there was no term limits, they ever thought anybody was going to still be in the Senate when they were in the eighties or on the Supreme Court in their eighties. So who did amazingly great things and then sort of transitioned out of power to the, and then that coincided with uh, the civil rights movement in Vietnam. And once that particular word for us, cut out. I just cut. they never relinquished it. So I've oh. saw, I've talked about this in other jobs, but uh, uh, Generation X will be the first generation to completely, mostly get bypassed from the U.S. political system. And whatever, so the millennials will be the likely next group that the power gets transferred to. And then you talk about those people taking power in the, in the political system in their 30s and then not leaving until their 90s. How many generations are so you going to skip? We don't have term limits. So I think that nobody ever, I think, and it's, when you're in 1776, it was really easy to overlook the fact that and never consider that people might live until their 80s. And certainly, they never even considered that somebody would want to make a career out of being a politician. That's a tremendous point. That's the only thing on their fucking mind. Yeah. Yeah. Madison and uh, Hamilton, who got shot by Burr, but uh, and Jefferson, they all fled back to Virginia and at the behest of people in power yeah. in Washington later came back. And really the only been there, done that. Yeah. And the, really the only one that stayed and thank God he did was Adams. And uh, the Adams were the first political dynasty, but they were closer to the center of power. And for and then you have a big, I just read a great book called uh, the coming storm. Mm. And uh, by uh, about prom night, yeah, yep, yeah, uh, anyways, uh, not prom night, George uh, Friedman, George Friedman. Sorry, I thought you said the author's name, but uh, yeah, he said that Reagan was the last transition, and the next trip, we're gonna go through a cultural shift. <laughs> Reagan was the last cultural shift, and the next president will be the next president. So if the next president after Trump, if he wins again, or after Biden, will be mm -hmm. what the trajectory of the country is going to be. Certainly. Andrew Jackson was that. That makes one. sense. It, yeah. it's, I, I, just numerous levels, I find it inappropriate. Like, from, from one point of view, like, A, like, if I'm the existing president, I get to fly around on Air Force One and, and, and do a just a fucking plethora of events on the country's dime for one which i don't find appropriate for one uh, b and c like senate and house people are like you've got your stipulated terms where you can it's just find it ridiculous where you only have so many years per term so i'm like so the president should have like say seven to nine years or six or eight or whatever the hell it is like you have a one term do your deal fuck off how it'll, it'll be interesting do your thing it'll be interesting That's to off. see if if millennials if they're going to hold the presidents for so long be interesting to see if they evolve in their political thinking like how the uh, 70s people did right because they're all conservatives now aren't they? it's hard to um, ascertain um Looking at recent trends, most people are. Yeah, most folks that like it, it, polls, fuck off. Polls mean absolutely nothing, which we've learned since 1968. Polls mean not a thing. Um, you look at what the activity in the world, it's insane. So I think polls are being more used now to persuade or shift opinion rather than report on opinion which is just fuck it just pisses me off it just disappoints the ever living out of me um 
we're at a we're at an interesting time in the fact that the United States is stepping back as the world cop, and there's more chaos that we are paying over with with Matt with um, mass media is painting a unrealistic picture of the the bind the ties that bound all the countries together. Like they're talking about the EU coming to an end. The guy that's now in charge of the EU is probably the last president of the EU. Okay. Germany's talking about pulling out of the EU. Um, and I know it doesn't matter that much to us, but it is a it is a, it is a sign of the fact that America is um, sort of recoiling back into itself and not playing such a large position in the world. Thus, it's creating a lot of political instability across the country. We're in the middle of a pandemic, which is completely bonkers and nobody can understand. And we're in the most divisive election that we have ever experienced. And we're going through this huge cultural shift all at one time. That puts a stress on any civilization and any group of people. So if everything doesn't seem rational right now, well, there's no reason for it because we are in completely uncharted territory. So where are we, where we're going, gonna get where are we better? I, I, I don't, I mean, really? Is that going to be easier next time? No. Yeah, it'll, it'll normalize. Fuck that. It'll normalize. These commie bastards have shown their colors and they're not going to pull back their horns. There's no fucking way they're pulling back their horns. This, this, this is the this is the low end of the assholishness that we're gonna see for a long fucking time until we stomp this idiocy into powder. Well, they used to uh, when the bull moose party was running. It was a complete time of chaos. I mean, so but one of those. You, how can you remotely compare? the Republicans, Democrats, and the Bull Moose Party to what we are seeing now. I'm just saying, can you imagine how traumatic that would be for the people that were I'm there? I'm sure it was time? quite disturbing at the time. Yeah. And I don't disregard their impact whatsoever, but I think Bull Moose versus absolute, full-on, but lazy, full frontal, newly commie, He's not even remotely comparable. I, I mean, holy sweet Jesus. Fucking uh, Kennedy, and when he first ran, would be a pretty much hard liner right wing conservative a hole now, which would blow most commie bastards' minds. So I'm just saying, given the comparison, I, I don't see how it lines up. I, I see the sadness of what. It's out there as far as comparison and potential, but uh, the shifting otherwise, I don't know. My worst thought is that we don't fucking teach civics and history and fourth grade on. We are more tremendously rat fucked than we ever thought possible in our entire generation. Just saying. Well. Like, we should, if we, we don't should, we should, fucking should. preach what happened and what could, then we are so bound for assholishness that we can't even describe the level of cluster that's going to come into into our world. Seriously. We, we should pick the movie for next week. Yeah, we're Ooh. two and a half hours in. and, and Oh, shit, Earl. Then I, I, I have been deemed to pick the movie, and I couldn't not be more proud to pick the movie. Despite all you sons of bitches interrupting us the entire time, I picked the movie <laughs> by Mr. Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. What did you just accuse us of? Being assholes. <laughs> Full metal jacket, Joker. That's the fucking movie for the next time we meet you, sons of bitches. The full metal six jacket. two yep. millimeter full metal jack. Yes. Snooze fast. Oh, oh, and right. before I forget, I know we just picked a movie. We've been through a bunch of other shit. We got legitimate listener feedback, and they asked of us sort of a weird combination of love line and um, stock picks. 
our top two or three pickup lines uh, each. So it's pretty much uh, love line related. So I thought that was. Uh, I say we make that in the next episode. No, yeah. no, we we have to get a couple, at least one of our favorites in this, and then we can go pound sand. Yeah, because I'm getting super text messages now. But anyways, uh, I will give my oh. first one, which I stole from somebody else. But um, my one of my favorite all time pickup lines is, "My name is uh, Will Snuggle, and how are you?" <laughs> yes, I come from a long line of snugglers. My daddy was a snuggler, so is my grandfather. And take it from there, yeah. Or skip town, or uh, yeah, there's that also, yeah. So, y'all got your favorite pickup lines, like Joel. My skip town worked in New York with what's her name, so now I've always been too good to rely on a, on a mm. line. <laughs> you just say, My name's Joel, and they go, Oh, the vapors, yeah. Yeah, I'm six foot four. I don't need a pickup line. Oh yeah, that's that is pickup line itself. Yeah. <laughs> well, hashtag, you got any good ones? Hashtag weak sauce. But anyways, yeah. So when I roll out of town, you're pretty much fucked. Anyways, uh, what's up, Ross? No. I know you probably could pull one of the yours or two. Yeah. I just prefer to play hard to want. So. <laughs> Easy to get, hard to want. Yes, nice t-shirt. Yes. Uh, bueno. Yeah. Work. You guys are not helping the average consumer out there. They don't have a tall stature or balls ballsville in their corner. So, Richard, I found it's atmosphere and uh, the libations you apply. Definitely, good Irish bar location. The, location. Like location is important. Yes. Yeah, good Irish bar with the Ooh. full. Irish settings, which means mm. some sort of mm. not football on TV. I possibly horse racing. I ain't for sure. Picture for of the sure. Pope, picture of the Kennedys, and some Guinness is a good foundation. Really for solid foundation for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I have never used the pickup line, so I'm. <laughs> Am I seriously the only person that ever spit out? I can't be the only guy that ever spit out lines. I mean, like seriously. Come on. Thank you. Honestly. Are. The one that worked, the one, the conversation thing that I sort of anchored every beginning in is I don't care how old you are or uh, much about your past. Let's just start fresh from here out. Let's just go fuck from here. <laughs> <laughs> I will attest that Richard is one of the top three uh, wingmen I've ever had in my entire career. I've cratered several of his relationships. <laughs> you have cratered several. You've also enhanced more than one of my weekend relationships, but my overall uh, long-term, yes, definitely cratered. Uh, the short-term, how your mom and them incidents, you've also been quite the asset, and that's important. And I will acknowledge that skill uh, many times over. I I feel kind of sad that you guys don't have any other game besides uh, just dragging on. That, I know you're I know you're holding I've back. Got, I know you're being I've shy. A, I've got a lot of knowledge to share to a willing audience, but we got to wrap it up for tonight. <laughs> well, that's your excuse. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that it works. next week or something. Okay, so uh, we I have exposed myself in, in uh, more ways than one to the. Uh, literary terms of in next endeavor um we've discussed the movie of the week by mr joel which is american graffiti and all its impacts and conversations thereupon we've also established that next week we'll be talking about full metal jacket private pile which is one of my all-time favorite uh, endeavors it was the first movie I ever purchased on VHS and the next edition of Technology Gold DVD, which most folks have no clue what other one means because we all just get it on iTunes now. But for those of you playing along at home, this movie I purchased on both of those, so it's very near and dear to me. Um, we will continue the conversation about uh, pickup lines 
we'll have more time to concern those and probably get a better, more open and honest conversation since everybody else clammed up like a chicken with a rope out of its ass this weekend. Um, again, we thank our good friends at B&K Auto for their sponsorship and love and support. And we'll try to do our best to uh, earn that every week. Until then, we will close this episode at uh, basically two hours and 30 minutes because we are all a bunch of chatty fucking Cathy's this week. Which it's going to happen from time. It was just a nice spirited conversation on numerous topics. And so if you have um, things we should discuss and or discuss in the future, if you have specific topics, if you have um, love line concerns or stock tips, please be sure to send them in and we will address them as accordingly. Until then, uh, please like and share uh, this podcast on both YouTube and iTunes and Spotify and anywhere else this medium is found. Um, if you have questions, please uh, submit them to one of these a-holes on your screen, uh, either Mr. Raleigh, myself, Brad Burr, or Mr. Joel. Uh, we are all on social media. We also have uh, an actual dedicated email account called the Far Reaches Podcast at gmail.com so get off your lazy fucking ass and email us there or text or quote whatever we want to hear from you so we'll let you go for now we will be up and running soon again and i hope to see you then if you have any questions comments concerns please feel free to drop us a message to any of us and we'll pass it along until then but i can deals and we wish you all the absolute best and once again just to remind you that we love you and thank you so much and p.s hi your mom and dad and we'll see you soon